Good afternoon, members, members of the public, council officers and the press, and welcome to this meeting of Angus Council. As members are aware, we are currently in the pre-election period in light of the forthcoming Scottish Parliament elections on the 6th of May. You have all received a copy of Angus Council's pre-election guidance. Section 5 of the guidance cover, covers publicity, which includes online council or committee meetings which are webcast or subsequently published by the Council. We need as members to be aware of the legal requirement not to publish anything which appears to be designed to affect political support for a political party. The legislation makes it clear that the timing and circumstances of publicity is a key factor in deciding if it is politically partial, which is why there is greater sensitivity during the pre-election period. The key test is whether a particular act can be perceived as seeking to influence public opinion or to promote the public image of a particular candidate or group of candidates, whether or not they are existing members. A common sense approach is required, and I would remind members simply to be mindful of this in their discussion and debate today. Thank you very much. Mr McCaskill, are there any apologies for absence, please? Yes, there is, Deputy Provost. One apology from the Provost. OK, thank you very much. Members, you have been advised uh, that we have received uh, two uh, deputation requests in relation to items six and seven on our agenda. But before I ask you to determine whether or not we're going to hear these deputations, I'm going to provide a little bit of advice to the deputies and uh, that, that's the story. So should Council agree to the deputies to grant your request for a deputation today, it is important that anything said will not adversely impact any future CAT application that may come forward. To avoid this, please note that any body or person speaking at Council today must not go into the specifics of any potential CAT application. I would also explain that the Council cannot decide at this stage to su support specifically any potential CAT application. And there are two main reasons for this. CATs have a legal process that must be followed. This involves complying with criteria, including a public consultation. Also, elected members, some of whom would be responsible in future for determining any specific application, might well be seen as prejudging and favouring a particular future community asset transfer over any other CATs and alternative proposals, which must also be considered as part of the CAT process. I hope that makes sense. There is nothing to prevent anybody or person speaking at council today in favour of the option more generally of using the Lockside Leisure Centre building for community asset transfer purposes or for any other purpose as detailed in the public consultation. And I would also remind members that if they have an interest in the deputations, then should there be a vote on whether the deputations are heard or not, they should leave the meeting at that time. Members of the Council, do we agree to hear these deputations for agenda items six and seven? Agreed. Agreed. Thank you very much. Well, what we'll do is we will hear them at the point in the meeting when they come up on the agenda. Mr McCaskill, any declarations of interest, please? I think, Chair, that's for each individual member oh, yes. at this point. My apologies. Not of, course it is. of course it is. Councillor McMillan Douglas, your hands up first. And he's on mute. And you're on mute, Councillor McMillan Douglas. Apologies, Deputy Provost. Uh, I would like to declare an interest for items six and seven. Um, I, I, over the last uh, number of weeks, I've got to know uh, Mr. Guild uh, well, and uh, although that wouldn't actually influence the way that I voted or talked at council, uh, I think it would, um, uh, some people might be uh, upset if I took part in the discussions and therefore I will withdraw for items six and seven and I will not vote on those either. Thank you, Councillor McMillan Douglas. Councillor Warren. Yes, my declaration of interest is on a, agenda item 14105 slash 21 as a director of Angus Alive. I will uh, intend staying in the meeting, and if there's any vote, I will vote under my normal dispensation. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Councillor Warren. Councillor Duff? 
Yeah, thanks, Deputy Provost. I've got declarations of interest to make on item 14, 105.21, a director of Angus Alive, similar to Councillor Warren, and items 4 and 15 as a council um, appointed member of the Te City Deal Joint Board. That's report 95.21 and 106.21. I will stay in the chamber for both um, or all three items and vote if necessary. Thank you, Councillor Duff. Councillor Devine? Uh, mine's the same as Councillor Wan. Uh, item 14, report 105 21, general exclusion as a, a board member of uh, Angus Alive. Okay, thank you, Councillor Devine. Councillor Salmond? Yes, uh, my declaration's on agenda item 17, report 107.20 which is an exempt report I'll make for the uh, information available as part of the exempt part of the meeting. Okay, thank you, Councillor Salmond. Councillor Miles? Yes, Commissioner. Uh, my declaration is a rather loose one in item 12. As an active farmer, I obviously have an interest in the, the growing strategy, but it's far enough removed not to be directly conflicting uh, this report, so I will take part. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Miles. Councillor Fairweather? Councillor Fairweather, you're on mute. Sorry, Chair. That's okay. Um, uh, exactly the same as Councillor uh, Duff regarding item four, and there's the, the other item as well. I think it's item um, uh, 15. Okay, and you'll remain in the I meeting. will remain, yes. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Councillor Fairweather. And last, but by no means least, is myself, agenda item number 13. I am a council appointed director of the Moneyfeed Golf Links Limited, but I have a specific exclusion and I will remain in the chair and in the meeting during consideration of that item. Councillor Laurie. Yep, yeah, just on that, I'm also a board member of the Moneyfeed Golf Links, so item 13 as well, but I will remain in the meeting for discussion and voting. Okay, thank you very much, Councillor Laurie. Okay, members. Councillor Colin Brown's after. Oh. I'm now getting my yellow hand to work. Okay. Sorry, Councillor Brown, I didn't see your hand, but okay. Um, I would like to make a declaration of transparency on agenda number seven, report 9821, as on the 28th of August 2018, I arranged for a local businessman, Mr. Mark Guild, to inspect the Lockside Letter Centre. Also in attendance was Mr. Alan McEwen and two other officers. Uh, this businessman is not a personal friend of mine, but is an acquaintance. I have sought advice from Standards Commission and on their explanation, I have decided to leave the meeting when these two items are being discussed. Uh, I am also a member of the Station Park Community Trust. Thank you. Thank you very much, Councillor Brown. No one else? Just in case their hands are not working, I'm looking at the screen. No, it seems to be, that seems to be it. Okay, thank you. Members, agenda item number three, three, one, are minutes of the Council meetings and we are asked to be submitted for approval as a correct record the minute of meeting of this council of 11th of February 2021. Is that agreed as a correct agreed. record? Agreed. agreed. Very much. And for information only in minutes of the committees, uh, 3.2b to j, uh, do we agree to note these for information? Agreed. Okay, thank you very much. Agenda item number four is an information report for the period October 2020 to March 2021. And it's a report by the Director of Strategic Policy, Transformation and Public Sector Reform. And I think Mrs. Smith is going to introduce this information report. Thank you. Thank you, Deputy Provost. I'm, I'm really pleased, actually, to be able to, to introduce this information report to Council today. Um, clearly, the, the responsibility, the governance arrangements for Tay Cities uh, sit with the Joint Committee. Um, which, which incorporates other uh, council areas uh, across uh, the Tay Cities area. 
However, it's really important that members of Angus Council are cited uh, very well on, on the proposals that are being uh, progressed through the Tay Cities Joint Committee arrangements. I'm really pleased to confirm here publicly today that the deal was, was signed in, in uh, December and uh, to note that Angus Council members were actually cited on much of, of uh, what was uh, to be uh, agreed through Joint Committee in signing the deal. However, there was a confidentiality around that prior to uh, signing the deal with both governments and uh, the reports were therefore on green. This information report now helps us to, to make the, the information public on the different aspects of, of the proposals that, are, that will be brought forward. And any um, further uh, work that we do in, in the projects that are identified in the report will be brought back to Angus Council for information clearly in, in due course. Uh, the, the report covers um, projects ranging from rural broadband to the Angus Fund, which is £26.5 million, which has a number of exciting opportunities. Um, and we'll hear, hear later in the report one or two of those, or two of those actually, that we're hoping that Angus Council will consider uh, bringing forward an early course. Um, the, the engineering partnership, um, some industrial fund side deal money that we managed to attain um, for uh, the Zero Foresight in, in Montrose, work that we're progressing through culture and tourism programme and clearly Hospital Field has been the very first beneficiary of that through, through Joint Committee. Um, there's also a, a skills and employability programme which we will um, be bringing forward projects uh, around in due course. Also just to note that more recently there was some uh, funding made available to the Joint Committee and, and therefore the Tay Cities arrangements of £220,000. It was a very short time scale for turnaround on that. However, we did manage to secure some, uh, some revenue funds that will help us progress uh, some of the business cases that, that we need to um, develop for consideration by the Joint Committee, notably in the agri-tech area and the, the drone developments and also uh, for the hospital field uh, skills support uh, in there so that they can open in, in a short order this year when things begin to, to open up again. Uh, uh, more generally and people are, are able to move around, hospital field will be in a very, very good position um, to, to show that some of that early funding. Um, that's all I wanted to say, uh, Chair, um, but I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you, Ms Smith. Yes, I think there's a few hands up here. The first one, Councillor Davy, a question? Apologies, it was a comment. Okay. Councillor Fairweather, a question? I'm the same. Councillor Speed, a question? Comment. No, okay, no, that's okay. Councillor Devine, a question? Yes, a question. Uh -huh. Ah, good. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, it's just a very small one. It's, it's great. Thanks very much, Mrs. Smith, for bringing this forward. And we've got a lot more um, detail than we've perhaps had before. Um, so that's great. I just would like a little bit more detail on 2.3.5 about the low carbon housing project and wondering just, you know, kind of how many houses have been identified and is there a percentage? Uh, is it like 50-50 for new build? A 50 uh, for retrofitting, because clearly the retrofitting is going to be very important learning for us. Yeah, ab absolutely, Councillor Devine, um, through yourself, Chair. Um, the housing project has identified 100 new build opportunities and 50 retrofit, but it is really, as you note, about the learning that we can take from both of those uh, opportunities. Um, 
certainly be looking at our own council housing stock and there may be others on the call who want to come in on that but we have nearly 7,000 houses as a council alone um, and uh, when you take that out over the region clearly the numbers rack up but it won't just be for local authority housing that this will be of interest, the findings and the learning will be of interest, I'm sure, much more broadly. Okay, thank you both. Councillor Miles, a question? Yes, a question. I have a comment as well, but I'll, I'll restrict it to the question just now. Uh, in the, the uh, multi uh, uh, things that we're doing, uh, the rural broadband programme is getting million pounds. It's identified five million for rural and uh, sorry, uh, half a million for rural broadband and half a million for local full fibre network. How will this actually be delivered? Because I'm getting a lot of questions from people in the rural areas uh, that are obviously struggling with, with broadband just now and wondering how this will be uh, phased out and uh, how they can then get access. Uh, will it support some of the, the providers or will it be building masts? I remember there was one uh, supposed to be going up in Bulk Hill that never actually materialised, but uh, just a, a little more clarity on, on what actually is going to be provided and how it's going to be provided. Thank you. Thanks, Councillor Miles. Um, essentially, there are two parts to this project. One is the connected with local full fibre network additional monies that we managed to attract from uh, UK government. And, and that's about providing fibre to 50 properties, Angus Council properties um, around Angus, which will then enable local communities to come together and use their uh, R100 uh, vouchers uh, that will be given to rural communities to then make that extra distance and connect into to that fibre for, for some people. But importantly, it's really the connections for local schools in the rural areas that are going to be of, of massive benefit through, through this project, as well as local uh, community uh, access uh, buildings. Now, the second part is where we're doing work looking at uh, where it's not possible to bring fibre. And we are looking at the development of uh, one mast, but we're working with the farming community to look at the provision of uh, equipment on their barns, which will enable um, a, a backfill to the mast and to fibre, which will increase the, the speeds. Now, Ali McLeod, who is leading on that project for us through, through our IT team, um, has been doing quite a bit of presentations out locally, talking to different groups, Councillor Miles, and trying to bring them up to speed with what's happening and where the opportunities are for people to engage with this project. Th thank you for that, because uh, to get fibre into some of the remote rural areas is almost impossible. So uh, it, it depends on getting these these uh, point to point or, or whatever they call them, the, the bounce to signal to, to get to rural broadband there. And an additional mass may well be required to, to uh, achieve that. Thank you. Thank you both. Councillor Sturrock, a question? Possible to bring fibre. And it's we more, are more of a development of uh, one mass. Okay, Councillor Cheap, a question? Yeah, thank you, uh, Deputy Provost. Um, actually, it was just on the back of um, what Councillor Miles has brought up, actually, can kind of still part of my funder there. But um, the question I have really is in relation to uh, the whole T-Cities deal, I think I brought this up before, that while it's of benefit to the whole of Angus, it's very much... I feel um, promoted to North Angus really because the Montrose and Brecon and, and its areas are, are receiving the most benefit from all of this. Um, there's not an awful lot there in South Angus, but acknowledging that um, the, on the rural broadband um, question, um, can, I, can Mrs Smith just uh, tell us, you know, what by rural, what is she meaning? Is our communities in Maniki and New Bigging who have terrible problems with Wi-Fi and connectivity Will they be served to benefit from this? So at least 
some direct group in South Angus get some real benefit out of all of this? So there are, there are a number of phases that are planned, Councillor Cheap, in relation to the rollout. The first phase will come up kind of from our growth up towards uh, Montrose. I, I, I would need to clarify the exact point it starts at, at, at the south area going up, um, but I don't think uh, Maniki would come within that boundary at this point in time. I think that's in a later phase. We don't have money for the later phases at the moment, but it is something that we would be looking to um, secure as, as, as much as, as quickly as possible from different funding sources. What I would say is that the bigger majority of resource that is going in for rural broadband is coming through the R100 programme, which is a national programme. And uh, people who are living in more remote areas should be able to access vouchers of up to £5,000 each. And if they work as a community, they can work with local WISPs to get the, the development of, of their masts, uh, which would then uh, backhaul onto to fibre to increase speeds over time. So it's a fairly complex picture, but it's one that over time, hopefully not too, too long, this is one of our early proposals to bring forward, given some of the issues that have been expressed by people around broadband in rural areas. And so, um, we'll, we'll move on this as quickly as we can and take every opportunity that we can. Um, but so can I just follow up, Deputy Provost, on that, just to clarify, can, if that's, that's good news from that latter part, Mrs Smith, you mentioned, but can we um, assume or ask that Angus Council will actually work with these communities to guide them through this, in that case, if these vouchers do come to help us, uh, to bring them together as a community to deliver that, they won't be left on their own? Yeah, I think uh, the intention is that the, there are a number of WISPs who have identified themselves as being interested in working with communities in, in and around Angus. I think there are 11 in total at the present time who have signed up with Scottish Government to do just that, Councillor Cheap. Um, but if there are communities who want to identify coming together, then be happy to look at that as well. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, thank you both. Councillor McMillan Douglas, a question? Thank you, Deputy Provost. Um, I just wanted to uh, thank officers and also thank my colleagues on the Tayside City Board. Um, uh, the leader of the council. Councillor council. McMillan Douglas, is, is it a question? Oh, I'm so sorry, it's a comment, apologies. <laughs> okay, that's okay. Councillor Bell, a question? Yes, thank you, Deputy Provost. Um, thank you, Vivian. I wanted to pick up on um, 2.8 under skills and employability. And I'm sure those projects have been subject to quality impact assessments, but I wondered if you could give us a bit of an idea on what is being done to improve diversity and um, avoiding gender segregation in, in those jobs um, and what community benefits might be available to support um, improving involvement in STEM subjects in school to feed into that work. Thank you. Thanks, Councillor Bell. Um, there's, there's a fair amount of work going on just now around the skills programme, as you might imagine, because it covers the whole of, uh, the, whole of the projects that we're, we're looking to bring forward have skills elements to them and others beside. Um, however, we're at the point where the outline business case has just been going, going through uh, both governments and so the detail of the projects within that are currently being worked up and it's within each of those that we would be taking account of the the qualities issues that, that, that you've raised there. However, what I can confirm is that more broadly the whole of the Tay Cities programme is looking at in inclusive growth. It's one of the fundamental principles um, for the Tay Cities deal 
uh, being agreed and skills is a key component within that. So in due course, we'll, you, we'll see more detail coming forward on that. I hope that helps Councillor Bell. Well, I look forward to seeing that coming, coming through. Uh, thanks, Vivian. Thank you both. Councillor Moore, a question? Yes, Deputy Convener. It's back on the Rural Broadband, I'm afraid. The Rural Broadband will be brought in by WISPs to the rural areas, I hope to the not quite so rural areas as well. But are the people who are having to go through the R100 scheme likely to be financially disadvantaged? because they will have to pay more for connections and for their monthly fees. Uh, Councillor Moore, uh, I don't have the, the full detail on the R100 programme that's been run through a Scottish government, but what I do know is that the vouchers to be made available to individuals are to the value of £5,000, that's my understanding. And therefore, if uh, communities decide to match their vouchers up together and be, are supported with the WISPs who are uh, on the list for the R100 programme, then there should be no uh, disadvantage uh, other than uh, they may wave their right down the road, I, I, I think, um, to other broadband activity that might take for, be taken forward in the future. Um, but I'm, I'm sorry, I don't have the full detail on the Scottish Government um, arrangements. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you again. Now, no more questions, so we'll go to comment. Councillor Fairweather. Thank you, Deputy Provost. Um, uh, it's really just a thanks to uh, Vivian Smith uh, and all involved actually in uh, to City Deal. It's certainly been a, a long a long time coming, but it's uh, now moving forward at pace, uh, as you'll see in uh, another report further on in this meeting. And it is good now that uh, the public are actually seeing some of the projects that are coming forward. Uh, and just to reiterate, uh, I, I know that um, things, uh Councillor Cheap's a little bit worried about uh, 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 Angus South, but our growth is in Angus South, and the, the first project, and it's uh, a £10 million project, that um, Vivian might want to correct me on that, it was the first business case that um, uh, that was approved. But thank you, Deputy Provost. Thank you, Councillor Fairweather. Councillor Speed? Sorry, Deputy Provost, okay. I was just That's trying right. to get my, my right. mic off. No problem. Okay, thank you. I'd just like to highlight 2.7, the cultural and tourism programme and the TACES, TACES investment of 5.5 million to Hospital Field House. I'm confident that this investment will help ensure that Hospital Field is no longer a hidden treasure, but one that shines brightly, attracting everyone locally, nationally, and far beyond. I'm looking forward to the first first phase opening in May this year and the unveiling of the fully accessible walled garden and glass house cafe. I'm delighted by the environmental improvements that have been made to maximise accessibility, creatively incorporating inclusive design within the existing architecture and landscape, some of which is listed. I'm inspired by the renovation plans for phases two and three, which will deliver cottage and studio accommodation, including two accessible facilities that will ensure that local, national and international artists and residents with access requirements and varying needs will be able to participate in all the programmes and events. Of course, partnership working will be key to ensure sustainability. And I know that project manager Lucy Byatt is keen to produce a cultural, cu cultural strategy with existing partners such as Angus Alive, education, local businesses and the community. Hospital Field hopes to become a real hub of activity that aspires to offer something for everyone, whether that be with the delivery of employment and learning opportunities, public events and entertainment, or simply the enjoyment of the peace and tranquility of the gardens. 
As councillor for Arbro East and Lunan, I'm proud to support Hospital Field House and its partners with this work now and as they journey on to achieve their goals and ambitions through the TA Cities deal. Thank you, Deputy Provost. Thank you very much, Councillor Speed. Councillor Sturrock. Um, thank you, uh, Deputy Provost. It's just a couple of uh, point, uh, comments uh, re relevant to 231 and 234. Um, it's the Drone uh, Technologies Project. It's good to see that they're progressing with the CAA because I know the CAA have concerns over the number of unauthorised um, drone operators that are going around. And coming back on the sad news of the, the rail incident up at Stonehaven, I see that Network Rail are now posing the idea of using drone technology or helicopters for uh, rail line uh, inspections. So that's another uh, opportunity that presents itself for the DTL. Um, regarding 234, the 5G network um, for Montrose Port, is it the timing going to be coincidental with when the offshore uh, comes fully on stream? Is that the time scale we're looking at? That's a comment and a question, but I'll oh, ask. Oh, yeah, I know. Yeah, yeah. That's okay. I'll Couldn't ask help myself. <laughs> Well, ask Mrs. Smith to answer that. Thank you. Hey, Councillor Sturrock, thank you for your, your question. And uh, with, with relation to the 5G opportunities, we've been having discussions with BT separately. There's some additional funding in T cities for 5G uh, research use cases. And uh, we think that there are opportunities um, to tie in with the opportunities that are presented through offshore wind, particularly through the use of uh, virtual reality. But the port is also uh, interested in other uses for 5G, like uh, water quality and levels and things, things like that, that, you, that that kind of technology can provide data for on a regular basis, but it's, it's all, um, at the early points of discussion, I would say, at this point. Gee, thank you. Thank you. Councillor Davey, comment? Uh, yes, thank you, uh, Deputy Provost. Can I just um, welcome this report and pay particular tributes to the officers and the projects which have been brought forward? I think as you read through the report, you can see you know, a rural broadband being identified. And I know that many of us will have dealt with concerns of this. So the additional investment is welcome. Um, can you also see the specific Angus Fund of 26 and a half million pounds, which uh, Mrs. Smith has outlined earlier on about more information, uh, which will really allow us to level up uh, all parts of the Angus economy. And as Councillor um, Sturrock has outlined, the Mercury drone port looks to be a huge addition for what we can offer in Angus. The Zero for Business Park in Montrose will again allow us to link in our ambition to create a world-class, world-beating area of expertise. It's also welcome to see Angus Council's commitment on building the road link between the A90 and the north of Angus, and I wish officers success in furthering the scheme and would lend my full support for them in doing that. Uh, we also note within the report the Rural Mobility Hub at Brechin looks set to be a huge addition, especially at improving connections and green connections throughout rural Angus. Um, and as has been mentioned, the engineering partnership and additional cultural and tourism program, I think really allows us to build on our engineering base and our tourism base. And I'm hopeful that these alongside the employability program will allow young people to have world beating opportunities right here in Angus. Whilst a lot of our sectors of excellence, agriculture, tourism, engineering are, are in-person based, we also have the opportunity to place Angus at the forefront of the remote working economy as we see people move further away from cities to be closer to the countryside. And with the commitment for super fast internet and the likelihood that visiting offices becomes a much rarer occurrence, this allows Angus to be a commuter hub for jobs potentially in Edinburgh or even London. So we can keep people in Angus who grew up here and we can also bring more people into Angus. So I really welcome all the, the projects and programs outlined in this report and thank officers for that. Thank you very much. Councillor McMillan Douglas, comment? Uh, thank you, Deputy Provost. Yes, I would like to thank uh, officers, Mrs. Smith and Mrs. Williamson in particular, for all the work they have put into the Tay Cities deal. And also um, my colleagues on Tay Cities board, the, the, the uh, 
the leader, Councillor Fairweather and Councillor Duff. We, we've all worked together over a four year period now to deliver this uh, Tay Cities deal. And it, to my mind, is perhaps one of the most important things we've done in the four years, because it is a potential game changer. And uh, we, people, uh, our colleagues have mentioned some of the things that it will change. Uh, we've made big advances in wireless broadband in the north of the county, particularly, I'm very proud to say, in Kirimir and Dean, uh, but also in Brechen uh, and uh, in towards Montrose. Uh, through the uh, two uh, Angus uh, started um, wireless uh, uh, broadband operators. We're now uh, moving that on, as Mrs. Smith has, has said, uh, with extra money. And uh, that will be a tremendous opportunity really for businesses and individuals in Angus. There's the whole advance on the agricultural side, which we'll come to later on the agenda, but really in a, in, a, in, a, in a very agricultural based county is, is hugely important. And the things to me on this is that this has been a team effort. It's been a team effort between North Fife, Perth and Kinross, Dundee and Angus. It's been a team effort between the UK and the Scottish governments. It's been a team effort across the council and it's going to deliver fantastic results for Angus. Thank you, Deputy Provost. Thank you, Councillor McMillan Douglas. Councillor Miles, comment? Yes, uh, others have already uh, outlined the huge amount of work done by officers getting to this position. Uh, when I was involved with it in the early stages, I, I realised there was a huge amount to be done. And uh, again, I commend officers to getting to where we are. A tremendous amount of work has been done behind the scenes to get us to this very exciting uh, uh, stage. And uh, the, the hope that it will create a lot of uh, new job opportunities, investment in Angus. I know there's many cynics out there say, oh, it'll bring in all the, the, the people from out west and then go away again. I don't think so. I think that many of these jobs will be going to our local uh, uh, communities and be sustainable uh, uh, jobs for the local communities. Uh, and it's up to our, our uh, uh, employ, employment market to in the, the, the Angus area to rise to this challenge. So uh, looking forward to, to a very exciting time in the future. Thank you, Councillor Miles. No one else for a comment? Okay, as it's an information report, there are no recommendations in it, so that's fine. Thank you very much, all of you, for your contributions, and thank you, Mrs Smith, for your very detailed answers. Um, members, we'll go on to agenda item number five now, which is another information report for the period May 2018 to February 2021. And it's a report by the Director of HR, Digital Enablement, IT and Business Support. And Ms Faulkner and Ms Cooper is here today to answer any questions. Ms Faulkner or Ms Cooper, do you wish to say anything to members or will we just go straight to questions? Um, uh, thank you, Prov uh, Deputy Provost, and good afternoon. Um, I'd just like to do a short introduction um, before handing over to Caroline, um, who will highlight um, particular areas of the report. This report provides an update on the progress made in terms of our digital ambitions since our digital strategy was first published back in 2018. And it provides a forward plan for the next stages in the delivery of our service. There's been significant progress made across many areas, including process redesign and automation, implementation of our applications team and strategy, improvements in our service desk, moving to services to the cloud and upgrading our network and infrastructure. Many of these improvements have had a measurable positive impact on the lives of Angus residents and the working lives of council employees. The report also highlights the work that's been carried out during the period of the pandemic. And I'd like to pay tribute to Caroline Cooper, service leader, and the whole of the digital enablement and IT team for the tremendous efforts that they've made to support all services of the council in their delivery, including ensuring that the wheels of local democracy were able to keep turning. So I'm now going to hand over to Caroline to provide uh, a little bit of further detail and to take any questions or comments that you have thereafter. Thank you, Caroline. Thank you. 
Uh, good afternoon, and I'm really pleased to be able to come to the meeting to summarise the report. There really are a number of digital delivery highlights covered in the information schedule, which touch on all areas of service delivery for Angus Council. So the report covers the Digital by 2020 plan, which came to full council back in 2018, the improvement in digital skills within the council, uh, a large number of digital te technology developments and the Angus Council contribution and input to regional digital programmes, which we've heard some about uh, in the previous item and national programmes. So in the, in the two years plus since this group agreed the Angus Council digital strategy, we, we have made tremendous progress in all areas to improve services for residents and for businesses in Angus as well as supporting staff to work efficiently and in many cases seamlessly, remotely or at home. I want to point out a couple of highlights. Um, one of those has been the ability that we now have to implement new automated, simple and very accessible digital processes for services, such as the 23 uh, new COVID-19 related services that were introduced uh, last year and are continuing to be introduced this year, which can be ready for the customer to use within hours of announcements being made by the Scottish Government, just as an example. And those covered business support grants, um, funds and processes to support residents such as the humanitarian aid requests uh, known in Angus as ARC or, or even things like vitamin D orders. So demand from customers actually remains very, very high uh, for digital transactions. We're running at over 12,000 uh, requests and digital transactions per month being logged via our website uh, and automated forms. And as an example, I'd just like to pull out the booking for recycling centres that, that uh, had to happen last year. Nearly 20,000 appointments were booked online and only 24 actually required support from the contact centre. And that's very much supported our approach to, to encourage those who can to access the services digitally to free up a contact centre resource to help those that can't. I'd like to highlight that all our hard to reach schools now have broadband services, the Wi-Fi and the VoIP. And uh, you can see in the report uh, a, a testimonial from one of the teachers where it really has changed uh, the, the services that they're able to deliver there. Um, the, and also the, the staff, our own staff, um, as you know, as, uh, as COVID hit, were pretty much almost immediately able to uh, work from home almost overnight. However, the pace of technology, as we've heard in the last report, continues to change very fast. And so does the expectations of end users and our res residents. So no sooner have we... Uh, done all those things, then there's a requirement to improve. And we have been doing that through the DSE programme, which has been delayed slightly by supply chain issues, as I'm sure you're all aware. And now we're starting to consider the new changes that we're going to have to make to enable uh, Angus Council to be much more virtual on a, on a more sustainable basis. So the infrastructure has been designed over a number of years, primarily um, assuming that we're all operating from council premises and we're shifting that to mainly remote. And obviously there's a lot of work still to do to make that absolutely seamless. So we're working now on a full set of productivity tools and collaborative tools and a sec to secure the infrastructure that is significantly less dependent on routing all the information and transactions through the council data centers, which are based in Forfar and are both, and to change that infrastructure so that the routing is much more into the cloud and much more appropriate to the way that we're working now. We're also looking at our application portfolio. Uh, you may be aware that we've got well over a hundred different and very distinct applications that we use to run the, the business of the council. And uh, 
we now need to address looking at improving those so that the applications truly support the outcomes and the services that the council provides. And one of the ways that we'll be doing that is to look at automation of interfaces, for example, to improve data quality, which in turn um, improves information and decision making. Wanted to touch briefly on security. Our biggest vulnerability remains phishing and social engineering. And in terms of the next steps, we're looking to increase the training and communication program to combat uh, any issues that may arise from that. We'll also be introducing new technology measures and we're continuing with our maintenance and testing programs necessary to keep all patching up to date as applications move to the cloud. Finally, I'd like to just mention that in going forward, we want to continue and increase our engagement with customer groups to ensure that the services are designed with a customer at the center and accessibility is designed at the outset. As we move to the next level of our digital journey, and our digital maturity, we need to be considering much better that end-to-end -end experience for residents that consume our external services, but also for our staff who are consuming internal services to make sure that what we're providing is fast and reliable. And this report sets out some of the detail um, that we'll be covering to do that. Thank you. Thank you very much, very comprehensive. Um, presentation, Caroline, thank you. Uh, questions, Councillor Bell, question? Thank you, Deputy Provost. Yes, and thank you both very much. Having worked in IT programmes in the NHS, I don't underestimate the amount of work that lies behind that paper. Um, so, so well done and, and thank you to the team. My question was around um, 4.7. Um, as a bit of a geek that jumped out at me around GovRoam. Um, it's quite interested to see that and wondered if that would in, that includes external partners such as the third sector and other agencies, maybe like police and fire and rescue service. And if that that might be an early start on something like a, a shared record um, that would actually make a big difference to our citizens when they're accessing services. And I know it would make a big difference to our staff. Um, who are delivering health and social care. Um, I, um, don't set my expectations too high. I've been waiting on it for a quarter of a century already. But, you know, that's something that keeps coming up. And I just wondered if that might be a portal to, to that piece of work happening in due course. Thank you. Caroline, do you want to answer that? Oh, yes. Thank you uh, for the question, Councillor Bell. Yes, GovRoom is a national initiative. Um, unfortunately, at the moment, uh, not that many uh, bodies, if you like, have signed up to it. However, the NHS has, which makes that quite a fundamental mechanism, if you like, for improving our, our comms. And so it's, it's actually fundamental to a lot of the operation that Angus Council do. Um, in terms of who else will sign up to that, that is up to those other bodies. So I'm, I'm not um, sure how much that will progress. Okay, thank you both. Councillor Moore, a question? Yes, thank you, Deputy Provost. Caroline, I'm looking at Paragraph 5.3 of the report, un unsurprisingly, the Rural Broadband Project. And it says it, the project's broken down into five phases. But phase one is our growth break in Montrose, and the other phases are being worked on. Can you give us an indication, firstly, of where the other phases are going to cover? And secondly, do we have the funding to cover that? Ms. Cooper, if you want to answer Councillor Muir. Thank you. Thank you for the question. I, this, uh, I think, was covered in the, the last section. Actually, at the moment, phase one is the agreed phase or um, the phase that's kind of going to be underway. The further phases are still uh, under um, discussion and, and debate. Yeah, I was just interested in where they were covering. 
Well, hasn't that been agreed yet? That that is is at such an early stage that it hasn't uh, actually been it, it hasn't actually been covered yet. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you both. Any further questions, comments? Okay, well, thank you to Ms. Faulkner and Ms. Cooper for their very detailed and comprehensive information report. Thank you both. Thank you very much. Members, we're going to move on to um, hear the deputation shortly in relation to agenda item number six. But before we do, um, I would just remind Councillor McMillan Douglas and Councillor Brown that they are uh, exiting at this stage. However, I believe the business support hosts of IT are able to move you both to the waiting room. I don't think you're going to have to do anything and they will admit you back once we are finished. Is that correct, Mr. Phillips? Um, yeah, that should be just be getting done just now. Thank you very much. And that looks them to be both in the waiting room. Yes, right? I, think, I think they're away already. Okay, thank you very much. Well, members, we did agree to hear the deputation um, from Mr. Mark Guild in relation to the agenda item number six. Uh, Mr. Guild, I, I would just remind you, you have 10 minutes to uh, address members and there will possibly be questions afterwards. But I have to remind you that your address to members must be relevant to the report that they have before them at this meeting today. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, can everybody hear me? Yes. Yes, good, okay. Ladies and gentlemen, elected members, thank you for the opportunity to speak today. Um, I'm sure you'll ve very much appreciate, I don't have a long speech for you today, um, just some comments with regard to the ASET's external review of decision-making regarding the demolition of Lockside Leisure Centre. Report, the report appears to conclude with three weaknesses. Number one, Angus Council had no option appraisals in place for the Leisure Centre on the 1st of May 2018 and sufficient information was not provided to the elected members. In future, it's up to the elected members to ensure they have sufficient information to make a decision and consideration should be given to providing training to elected members in this regard. Number two, the future Angus Council must provide better documentation and communication of such decisions. And number three, in future Angus Council should set out an indicative timetable for a decision to potentially interested parties. And these three weaknesses are not significant in nature. So um, with no option appraisals, insufficient information, a lack of documentation and a lack of communication, and a lack of decision-making timetable for interested parties, other than recommending the elected members are trained to ask for more information, everything appears fine. So with great disappointment, the Angus Council appear to have spent 13 and a half thousand on little more than a 20 page report and things appear far from fine. The external review provides more questions than answers for us all. So for my comments, number one, the report does not report relating to decisions taken by Angus Council from 2013 to present as the Chief Executive reports in a report today of 18th of March 21. It only reports on decisions taken by Angus Council from 2013 to the 7th of February 19 and does not begin to consider the decisions of the Council to defend the actions in court, not being in court, deciding to go there in the period 7th of February to August 2020 when there were many other options available. Number two, this external report is not based on all information. It's based on a selective remit of information provided by Angus Council. Number three, the auditor did not receive the opportunity to meet myself or indeed anyone at Guild Homes, despite our repeated requests to be involved in the independent external review. We had an information pack prepared for the auditor. We did not get the opportunity to provide it. We did not know the external review was ongoing, with your chief executive treating our most recent request for an update, of freedom, as an update as a freedom of information request, in effect delaying the response until the, available, the information was available online, and we were informed of this on the 12th of March 2021, last Friday. So, four, I must ask, how can an independent audit have taken place if the auditor 
only has access to one party, that party being Angus Council. And the party, and being Angus Council, providing the drafts and defining the tender remit. Number five, the report makes no mention of reviewing Guildholm's correspondence with Angus Council. It also makes no mention of being independent. The report has no author. Why has no one put their name to the report? Who is the auditor and who carried out the audit? I'm well aware with all internal audits, um, they're signed off and they have an, audit, an author. Question seven, who are assets? Well, it appears assets are the company who in September 2020 took over Scotland Creef, a company who have assisted in Angus Council internal audit work since 2014 on an ongoing basis and who continue to carry out audit work for Angus Council and appear to be contracted to Angus Council for future work till 2022. ASETs are in effect internal auditors for Angus Council. How could they possibly carry out an external audit? And how could it be independent? And why has the Chief Executive chosen to spend 13,500 on another audit, another internal audit? And why, most importantly, would it be portrayed to both the elected members and the public as an external audit? Indeed, these significant omissions lead me to one final question which I would ask the elected members to ask of the Chief Executive of Angus Council. Can you please confirm to the full Angus Council, to all elected members before you, that the ASET's external review of decision-making redemolition of Lockside Leisure Centre was independent, as required of you at the meeting of 5th of November 2020 by your elected members? An answer yes or no is more than adequate. I thank you all for your time. I hope my speech has been informative and helpful. Thank you, Mr. Guild. Any questions for Mr. Guild? No questions? Okay, we'll then go to agenda item. Well, we're on agenda item, the external review of decision to demolish the Four for Lockside Leisure Centre. Mrs. Williamson, I believe you're going to introduce this. Thanks, Deputy Provost. No, I wasn't intending to introduce the report. I was going to hand over to the people who actually wrote the report to uh, give a presentation of it. Um, I believe uh, both writers are, are with us today, so I would suggest we ask Mr Bennett from ASETS to come in. OK, thank you, Mr Bennett. Thank you, Deputy Provost. Um, I'll just uh, do an overall summary on the report, because as members will recall, it was agreed at the Council meeting on the uh, 5th of November, 2020, to commission the independent review uh, on the decision to demolish Lockside Leisure Centre. The re review focused on um, two key areas, the adequacy of decision-making by the council in reaching the decision to demolish Lockside Leisure Centre initially in May, 2018, at the Policy and Resources Committee, and then at the council meeting in February, 2019, and then identifying any lessons learned for improving the quality of reports submitted to Council and its subcommittees to support informed decision making. So in conducting our work, we have reviewed significant volumes of documentation. This included reports to and minutes of meetings of Council, as well as policy and resources and scrutiny and audit committees. We've also reviewed evidence submissions to the inner and outer houses of the Court of Session and other, other relevant supporting documentation. We met with five senior officers of the Council who were involved in or reviewed the decision-making process relating to Lockside Leisure Centre. And we've also reviewed online meetings of the Council in the past 12 months where Lockside Leisure Centre has been a feature of discussions. Members may re recall that Internal Audit did conduct a review of the decision-making process in October 2018, and this review was commissioned by the Chief Executive, and its primary focus was on the decision made by the Policy and Resources Committee in May 2018. And our review has covered similar areas. S several of our findings have been already identified in the Internal Audit report, and we've highlighted within the report where this is the case. And we've cross-referenced our recommendations 
to the internal audit report to avoid repetition. So the report sets out three key messages arising from the review. Um, these are as follows. The, the decision made by the council on the 7th of February 2019 to demolish was not unreasonable. We did identify some weaknesses from our work, although we do not consider these to be of significant nature. And, and by significant, we mean that we don't believe that the weaknesses identified have materially impacted on the decision making. The main finding from our review related to the options appraisal and documentation um, of the uh, appraisal. The documentation produced for the February 2019 meeting was significantly better than what was produced for the Policy and Resources Committee in May 2018, where the original decision was made. It was evident that the recommendations made in the internal audit report had been responded to. And notwithstanding this, there remained scope for improvement in the quality of documentation of options appraisals uh, within the council and council committee papers. We recommended that office, officers develop and implement formal guidance guidance on options appraisal using guidance from the Accounts Commission document that was produced in 2014, as well as the best practice set out in the HM Treasury Green Book. So the report uh, that is on your agenda contains an action plan, which sets out management's planned responses to our recommendations. And myself and Paul Kelly, who led the detail, uh, detailed work, will be happy to answer any questions that the members may have. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Bennett. Any questions? Councillor Davy. thank you. Um, thank you, um, Mr. Bennett. Um, as you will be aware, this is a, a matter which I've taken a, a close interest in, and I just would like, um, I have three questions on this. You mentioned that three weaknesses were identified and you've stated that none of these were significant. And you briefly touched on what you mean by the term significant, but I'm presuming from your comments, it's not a legal or accountancy term, rather it is a matter of, of your opinion um, regarding the, the weaknesses that you've identified. And would you accept that others looking at these weaknesses could consider them to be significant? Um, I, thank you, Councillor. I, I, I certainly could. It, it, uh, it comes down to, to uh, uh, basically professional judgment. And, and that was the terminology that was used that we decided in our professional judgment was the most appropriate. Um, perfect, uh, thank you. On page 82 of the combined papers, you don't go into the legality of the decision over the decision on the 7th of February to take it as an urgent item. But considering you found the paper presented could have been better and the report itself that, that you've prepared mentioned that it had a time constraint, it may have been considered a legally reasonable decision to make, but would you consider that best practice? And would you consider that if more time was permitted, a more detailed report could have been presented to council? I think at this stage, I'll, I'll bring Mr. Kelly um, into this. Yeah, <clears throat> thank you, Nick. Yeah, I, I think that we did mention in the report about those time constraints. I think what we did see was that we mentioned the report about that that options appraisal was a clear step up from what had been submitted to the Policy and Resources Committee. And I suspect with, with more time, you can always do a better job and a more detailed job, but it, we believe it was broadly sufficient for the purposes that the, the decision members were asked to make. Um, thank you very much for, for that reply. And my, my final question, you said it was broadly sufficient and you said in your initial that you don't think... Um, these matters were significant to impact on the decision-making process. But as identified in 2018, councillors were presented with one option and, and councillors unanimously went for demolition. In 2019, a more detailed paper was presented and councillors split 13-8 to demolish. Do you therefore think that when more information is presented, the option of demolition becomes less favourable? Mr. Kelly, do you want to respond? Yeah, to that? I think, I mean, that, that's a judgment ultimately for members to make based on the evidence provided. I think, with, as I mentioned earlier, with, with more information, the better informed members can be, hence why we made the recommendation, I think a recommendation two in the report, 
by that original decision, it's it's incumbent upon members to ask for the information they need to make the decision that they, they are being asked to make. Thank you. That's uh, all my questions, uh, Deputy Provost. Thank you, Councillor Davy. Councillor Salmon. Yes, can I ask the authors of the report to explain why they decided not to interview Mr. Guild as part of this independent review? So I'll answer that question, Councillor Salmond. So I think this review primarily focused on the processes and controls within the council and the council operated. And with that in mind, the members were the best people, sorry, officers, sorry, were the best people to speak with on that. And we took both people who had been involved in supporting that decision making, as well as speaking to others who were involved in a more legal and internal audit perspective. The other thing is worth worth noting is that in conducting a review, we have considered substantial information that Mr. Gilt had provided through deputations to council meetings and through court submissions. We reviewed all of the the papers that were submitted to court, so we had a good. We felt that with that information, we had sufficient information that allowed us to inform our decision making and our assessments. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Salmon. Councillor Blaise. Yes, thank you. Thank you very much, Convener. Um, I notice on page 76 under key messages. Uh, there are three sort of bullet points there. The final one ends with this, with the sentence, documentation of options in council and committee papers should be proportionate to the nature of the decision being made. Um, now, sometimes we are asked to make decisions on things with, with a very large uh, financial impact and, and Lockside Leisure Centre would be considered one of those, but sometimes we're asked to make decisions on things of a very limited financial impact, but things which have a huge public interest. And so I just wondered, when, when it comes to um, deciding what's proportionate, how, how do we work out uh, just, just where we stand on that? So with, with that, what we meant was there's a range of factors, some of which you touched on, that are important to, to determine the level of the documentation of the options appraisal. So things like you mentioned, the complexity of the decision, the financial uh, element of it, the risk associated with what you're doing, the, as you say, public interest. So you're probably looking at a wide, maybe five to six criteria that you would apply. And similar to when you manage projects and like doing project management documentation, you would apply the level of documentation commensurate with the risk and complexity of the project itself. So something that's relatively low key, low risk, you would have fairly light touch documentation, but something that's more significant, you would go for the full requirements set out in like things like the Green Book from the Treasury that sets out all, all, going down to things like using optimism bias, detailed documents and uh, commercial cases, etc goes with it. But probably five, six criteria you're looking to form that judgment. Yes, yeah, so it's certainly not based entirely on the financial uh, scale. Of no. The no, it's much wider than that. Thank you. Okay, thank you both. Councillor Moore, a question? Uh, I've actually got a number of questions, Deputy Provost. Can I start off, Mr Kelly, by referring you to page 78 and you referred there to the council officers you spoke to. Did you actually speak to any of the officers that wrote the reports or did the legwork in order to provide members with the, the information? So we spoke with, as you said, we spoke with the people identified, but we also had some email communication with uh, people who were involved in some of the technical areas as well to clarify matters that we needed answers to. Right. That, that isn't in your report, which would have been helpful. Okay. And on page 83, your recommendation two. Um, if I may quote the immortal Jim Hacker... I don't know what I don't know. 
Now, we have to rely on trusting our officers. You know, if this information is not there, how are members supposed to know that there isn't there is other information around that they should be asking for? I think that's we, 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 when we wrote that, what we had in mind was that when we looked at that paper the, that went to Policy and Resources in May 2018, we, we didn't believe it was sufficient to allow members to make decisions. And, I, and it's, we look at it and say, well, did, did members ask back what, what more information can we get? And it's part of a challenge process. And decision making, I do, do take on board your comment about you don't know what you don't know, but it's part of what we'd look for effective governance and, and passing a challenge. Yes, were you aware that a year earlier we'd had elections and 14 of the 28 members were brand new and we were still in the learning process? Yes. Good. And you refer to page 88 so to some guidance now would you expect that to be supplied automatically or do you think that we should be asking for it when we don't know it's there sorry what could you sorry council Moore, can you point me to what numbered page that is in our report i don't have council numbered papers 13 of your pet your report at the very bottom about the options appraisals, are you getting it right? Mm -hmm. Would you expect that to be supplied to members automatically? As part of training, perhaps? It's actually more for, this one's more for council officers to develop guidance. To well, It'd be used as a basis for guidance in producing options appraisals, I mean, but it's a valuable document nonetheless for members to have as a reference tool so that they can, they could use it as a, a measure to see whether the options appraisal stacks up. Right. And on page 89, which is your page 14, you are saying how we should uh, pre-agenda or the formal meeting request additional information and basically go and ask for other op the other options that are available and the other documentation. Do you not think that is stepping into operational matters? This is, this is a point more about governance and about making sure that members have sufficient information that allows them to support their decision making. So I, I suppose referring back to my, one of your previous questions about making sure challenging back when you don't feel you've got enough information, but we wouldn't be looking for you to produce that, but ask members to produce it for allow you to make your decision. Right. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Councillor Duff. Yeah. Thank you, Deputy Provost. I have one question for, for Mr. Bennett. Uh, in his remarks, I think Mr. Gould, and maybe I'm paraphrasing here, made the comment that because um, assets are doing other work for Angus Council, they cannot be independent. I wonder if Mr. Bennett would give, give us his um, reaction to that um, suggestion. Yes, thank you, Councillor. Um, we are bound by ethical guidance that is issued by um, the Financial Reporting Council and endorsed by um, our professional um, institutes. And that includes um, quite extensive sections on conflicts of, in, uh, of interest and independence. So in all engagements that, uh, that we take on, we consider our involvement against this ethical guidance and we also consult internally with our ethics partner. And I can um, just confirm that after this consideration, we did conclude that we had no conflicts of interest in relation to this review. Thank you, Mr. Bennett. Is that satisfying, Councillor Duff? Councillor Duff, you're on mute. 
Yeah, th thanks, Mr. Bennett. Thanks very much, and thank you, Deputy Provost. Thank you, Councillor Duff, and thank you, Mr. Bennett. Any other questions? Comments then? Councillor Davy, a comment? Um, thank you, Deputy Provost. The, the report states the weaknesses identified in demolishing the leisure centre, and as was an answer to my question, they state it's not significant, but this is a matter of opinion. And if you read the report, there seems to be a significant amount of information that would suggest this is a significant failing. And to me as a councillor, I certainly feel it's significant. I don't know how anyone could sit and say not being provided with the level of information required to make a decision is not significant. It clearly is. There, I'll just go through the report and we have some, some quotes taken exactly from the report. The report to the committee did not contain the level of detail that we would expect to support decision making. The paper did not contain any options appraisal. Yet somehow this isn't considered significant. Again, I would argue that councillors making these decisions would probably consider this a significant one. How can councillors have made a different decision if not presented with that option? The paper outlines three primary factors. And in the absence of a detailed options appraisal, this is another quote, in the absence of a detailed options appraisal, it is inherently difficult to determine if the recommendations made by officers was the one that represented best value. So if an external review can't decide whether we made a decision that was best value, how can council councillors, how can council officials? The full council meeting on um, in February had a split 13 in favour and eight against. And this was when more information had been provided following the meeting on the 18th. The external review found the paper could have been better presented and outlines that the report wasn't as detailed as it could be due to the main cost um, of the time constraint to produce this paper. Again, it was a choice to take this as an urgent item. And I will remind folk that I did ask for more time at this meeting. Recommendation two, again, the information on the paper to PNR did not provide sufficient information for elected members to make a decision. We also see additional problems through this report. No formal external strategy in place for this building after the opening of the new four for campus. No costs were factored in or ring fence within the business case. So we have built the new campus without taking into consideration the costs of getting rid of or transferring or removing the old one. If we read further into the report, documented evidence of communications with community groups in Angus Alive was not available. On the decision not to conduct a full survey on the building, the meeting was not documented. And these are all quotes taken from the report. And I would struggle for anyone reading these or hearing these as, as weaknesses would not consider these to be significant. The full council on the 7th states the report does not go into this area as it was a legal decision and no determination of the processes has been made by you. Whilst the decision was rational and was legal, was it best practice? I remind council that at the meeting, I asked for the report to be deferred for more discussions and that was rejected. And as you can see from the minutes outlined, that is where I tried to secure a significant extra time for more information to be provided and for four for members to be consulted. Again, the provost ruled this wasn't acceptable, but the provost would have received advice in regarding to that matter. I personally think from start to finish, it's been a very sorry saga. By refusing to consult and pushing ahead with a quick demolition, this report to me is quite damning. From the earliest decisions about the new campus in 2013 to the ones to demolish Lockside in 2018, this review makes clear the process was flawed from the start. We have a great new facility in Forfa, which will hopefully launch the lives of thousands of young Forfarians. But there have been many failures which are now in the public eye and we must learn from these mistakes. There was no exit strategy to deal with the leisure centre, no minutes with hamper scrutiny, Local councillors, four for councillors that is, were effectively frozen out despite the clear wish of four for councillors and has been seen the four for public. Not only did we end up in the highest court in Scotland and cost taxpayers hundreds of thousands, but we also ended up inadvertently causing a huge accountancy issue as buildings constructed on common good have now always been common good. And unless we sort out this accountancy procedure, this is the potential to significantly impact common good funds. So we have a failure to provide full information an urgent item which despite being legal in my mind wasn't best practice we have no records of key decisions and we've cost taxpayers hundreds of thousands in legal fees and we froze out the four for public and four for councillors at the initial stages a sorry saga indeed but i do think the light is at the end of the tunnel and that officers have accepted these weaknesses and identified how to address them which i do welcome it is clear to me this external review tells me what i think we already knew if councillors were given more time and more information, we would have not made the decision to demolish the building and it would have saved years and hundreds and thousands of pounds. 
and the reputation of Angus Council. Thank you. Thank you very much, Councillor Davey. Councillor Fairweather, comment? Yes, uh, uh, thank you, Deputy Provost. Um, yeah, this has been a, a saga that's been going on since 2013. Uh, and, and there's no doubt that mistakes have been made. Um, uh, and it's with different officers uh, and different councillors. Um, but really now, it's, uh, it's time to stop the blame game. Um, the council have been uh, asked to do a number of things. Uh, this last one was uh, an external audit, and that's now been done. Um, the report does state um, that the demolition was not unreasonable, but, um, and that three <coughs> right were identified. But on saying that, it also says there were four recommendations, and perhaps we should be asking our officers uh, what actions are they taking to, um, regarding these recommendations. But it really is, it's time to move on now. Um, and I'm hoping that um, the next report will find us a way forward. Thank you, Deputy Provost. Thank you, Councillor Fairweather. Councillor Moore, comment? Yes, thank you, Deputy Provost. Um, I have a problem with this report. If you go to the very start of this item and look at paragraph three background, it detail, detailed a proposed remit, timescale, cost, funding and procurement options for an independent external review of all evidence and decisions taken from 2013 to present in determining the decision to demolish Lockside Leisure Centre. And the council resolved that. But this only seems to cover 2018 and 2019. And we have not had any consideration of what happened prior to that and decisions made prior to that. We don't seem to have had consultation with the officers on the ground, just the senior officers. And in light of that, you know, I just wonder, okay, we've got four recommendations. Let's take the recommendations, let's move on. But let's just say, I don't think that the report covered what we asked for. Thank you, Councillor Moore. Councillor Duff, for comment. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Deputy Provost. Um, I think I'm conscious that a number of comments have been made by a number of members just in the last 10 or 15 minutes. Um, and a lot of those measures were considered by Lady Carmichael in the Outer House decision. And I think on all nine points, Lady Carmichael found for the council. Um, the appeal to the inner house only hinged on two issues, one of which was an entirely new issue introduced by um, Mr. Gill's council. So I think the, the, the comments about rush and emergency meetings, etc., all of that was, was discussed at the outer house and Lord, Lady Carmichael found for the council, and that was not challenged at the subsequent meeting. Um, my recollection, and this my, my memory goes back to about 2014, 2015, when the Forfar campus uh, was being considered. Um, my recollection is the Forfar people were consulted about the new school, as is the normal practice, and it was always a hub school with state-of-the-art sporting facilities. Um, and my recollection, again, is that it was always the council's intention to knock down the Lockside Leisure Centre because it was obsolete and had problems. And I, my recollection, I can't find the, the documentary evidence, was that money was put aside to knock it down. And I know there is £450,000 in the capital plan at the moment, and that's been there for a considerable number of years to effect that demolition. Thank you, Councillor Duff. Any other comments? Okay, members, we have the recommendations in the report in front of us, and it's recommended that the Council note the contents of independent external review report attached to Appendix 1 and note the actions already taken and to be taken in light of the report 
findings by um, the cons external consultants. Do we agree to note? Agreed. Thank you very much. Okay, members, the next item is agenda item number seven, Lockside Leisure Centre initial consultation outcome and the next steps. And again, um, before I ask Mr. Cochran to introduce this report, I'm going to ask Mr. Guild and I believe Mr. Wilson um, to, um, to speak uh, as part of the, the deputation. And I will remind both gentlemen again that um, we don't want, if you, you know, please, um, it's important that nothing that you say today will seriously or adversely affect any impact on any future CAT application that may come forward. And it must also only be relevant to the report that's before members today. So uh, Mr. Guild and Mr. Wilson, thank you very much. Thank you, Deputy, Deputy Provost. Um, you maybe didn't see me, I was waving my hands around like an idiot there. Um, <laughs> I had a question for Paul Kelly. Can I ask you that question? Uh, no, it's only for members, I believe. But Mr. McCaskill, is that correct? I'll ask the legal advice here. It's a very serious question. It's a very significant question. Chair, in terms of our current standing, standing orders, the wording is that it is questions by members only to the deputation. Okay, thank you very much, Mr. Guild. So, I'm sorry, that's in terms of the standing orders which I have to follow. Could I ask you the question, Deputy Provost? No. Okay, I'll do it in the newspapers tomorrow. Thank you. Um, moving on to item seven. Um, thank you for the opportunity to speak today. Um, I speak on the subject of Logside Leisure Centre, um, the initial consultation outcome and the possible next steps. I stress my wish to work with you all as elected members of all political parties to ensure you're fully informed with regard to Logside Leisure Centre and so enable you to make best value decisions for the people of Forfar and Angus. We've learned in our experiences to date with Angus Council when we work separately with different objectives, very little can be achieved. And when we work against each other, absolutely nothing can be achieved. But when we work together, we can achieve much and we can achieve a great deal for the people of Forfar. How can we help Angus Council with Lockside Leisure Centre? Well, we can help by simplifying the consultation response. The number one result in Angus Council's eyes is demolition with 120 votes or 35.9% of the 334 responses selecting demolition. Although rather oddly, the majority of these responses do not want demolition and grass. They want to see Lockside Leisure Centre replaced with a cafe and toilets, community assets that are clearly already there in abundance. The remaining four options retain the status quo, sell Lockside Leisure Centre, lease Lockside Leisure Centre, community asset Lockside Leisure Centre, together amount to 214 or 64.1% of the responses. And all these responses want Lockside Leisure Centre to be retained, all amount to no demolition. Why would Angus Council fail to recognise this? What a great success the consultation has been, even with COVID, Christmas holidays, a shortened consultation period and a bias towards demolition, and still 64.1% want Lockside Leisure Centre to be retained. And why would they not? A great facility, a public asset in a fantastic location. It's not sinking. There are no Angus Council engineers reports to say it's sinking. And we have a chartered engineers report that states the building's good for at least another 30 years. How can we help? Well, our engineers have looked again at Lockside from the outside, and they've again confirmed there's no change since September 18. That's nearly three years ago. We do need to see inside the building to re-inspect the building and give it a full health check. We need access with structural engineers, surveyors, electricians, heating engineers, painters, roofers, joiners, the list goes on, to assess the work required to make the building fit for purpose and importantly work out the cost of these works. We've requested access since August 2020. We have consistently been refused access to date. So elected members, we need your help. Please help us gain access to enable us all to be fully informed on the condition of the building. We need your help by agreeing and voting to go to phase two formal consultation to enable the community to consider fully how to make best use of the leisure centre. It's a public asset and we ask you today to support the public, support the community and vote for this phase two formal consultation. We would propose to create a charitable trust and or to work with other charitable trusts in existence 
We are happy to work with anyone to the benefit of the community. We are comfortable with a long lease and may also be prepared to consider a community asset transfer. I believe both the land and building are now, or soon will be, owned by the common good. There may be no need to dispose of the land or the leisure centre. Could the common good simply lease Lockside Leisure Centre to a community trust, part of the same community that own the land and Lockside Leisure Centre? We'll need legal advice. Angus, currently, Angus Council currently have around 400,000 in their budget to demolish Lockside Leisure Centre and replace it with grass. If this money was no longer required for demolition, we would hope to have the discussion. It could part of this money be provided to return the Lockside Leisure Centre to the condition Angus Council left it in when they vacated the building in February 2017. That would not seem to be unreasonable. Could a portion of the money be provided to a charitable trust to deliver, to help to deliver and could it contribute towards the long-term future of this proposed facility? Angus Council could also make a saving. There would be no need to spend £80,000 plus on new public toilets. The Lockside Leisure Tent toilets would be available for public use. We also recognise the need to have a discussion about who would be responsible for any future demolition of the building and how the performance of this obligation could be guaranteed. Our company, Build Homes, are happy to make a very significant contribution to help and work with both a charitable trust and Angus Council in this regard. We would need Angus Council to recognise that as a charity, no rates and no rates would be payable for any part of Lockside Leisure Centre used for charitable purposes. We could work together with services, roads access, parking, even open space maintenance. We could provide public toilets with ample space and facilities for all, including those with a disability. Together, we would hope to provide a facility created by the community for the community. Today, I want you to define yourselves as the elected members you really are, here to serve the community and save Lockside Leisure Centre. Now is your time to vote with the wishes of the community to together take the next steps and vote to provide access to all interested potential and existing charitable trusts to enable a sound and fully researched proposal to come forward for a formal consultation. Whilst it's important to establish Lockside Leisure Centre that is fit for use or can economically be made fit for use, is it, equally, it is equally important that the community has uses for this building. The next deputation from Alistair Wilson identifies some of the many community uses which would benefit Lockside Leisure Centre. I thank you for your time. I hope your this presentation to be both informative and helpful. And I only have one comment to make. Is Paul O'Kelly, the independent external auditor, the same person that worked as an audit manager for Angus Council for several years? Thank you, Mr. Gold. Mr. Wilson? Deputy Provost, thank you, you for giving me the opportunity. Can you hear me? Yes. 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 Thank you. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to address the Council with regard to the consultation and the uh, next steps for Oxide Leisure Centre. Today I'm speaking on behalf of the, the Station Park Community Trust. It's a very relatively new trust and uh, we held our first year AGM last night and I'm uh, the current chair of that group. Trust is currently very focused on the project to deliver the installation of a new playing surface at Station Park. This will be done in the near future, but also at the same time, we're looking at ways we can increase opportunities for the community and the public to access our current facilities and hopefully any facilities that we want to develop in the future. These facilities would include the proposal to use Logside Leisure Centre as a base for many of the activities that uh, we currently do and uh, are hoping to extend into. My remit within this is very much to do with the demand and uh, the looking at the feasibility of sports groups and other groups being able to access the facilities that are currently there, albeit with uh, some uh, top up of funding required to bring it up to standard. We, um, we would, I would hope through the, the informal discussions we've had with some of the other trusts in the area, be working as a, a blanket trust covering the other trusts that we have got some uh, notification that would be interested in working with us to um, improve the facilities for all. It's 
this will be a very brief discussion uh, of course, uh, comments that I'm making here. And they're clearly only on the opportunities that I feel that would be available at the Leisure Centre and its surrounds, being the caravan park, the country park, catering, etc. I think all these things are already uh, have been looked at with ourselves and we would hope to come back and have a proposal which shows a sound business case for having a future for Lockside Leisure Centre. It would be a leisure centre for the community and hopefully be at an affordable price and available at times that the community require it. I myself, as you may know, I have a, a fairly strong background in local authority and would use the expertise I have there to try and assist the project and the feasibility study to take this project forward again. Thanks for your time. If there are any questions, I'd be happy to answer. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Wilson. Okay, questions for Mr. Guild or uh, Mr. Wilson. Councillor Davy, question? Um, yes, it's to both um, Mr. Guild and Mr. Wilson. Um, based on your experience and your understanding, and your engagement with the, the Forfa public, do you think that there is demand for the people of Forfa to try and achieve this and find a use for this building as you have outlined? Okay, I'll let you gentlemen decide who's going to answer it between yourself, Mr. Guild and uh, Mr. Wilson. I think it'll be me answering that. Okay. Uh, there are very early days of, of discussions with them, but we would hope that we would be able to work as a single trust if necessary to look at things that I think would be available down there. And I think are things that would complement what's going on up at the campus, not uh, being in competition with them. I feel that it's a better location for some of the areas we'd like to attract down there. Um, and as I say, I think it would give, we need some time to work out some of the business cases a bit more than uh, I've commented on just now. But certainly the early indications are that there is a demand there from a lot of the groups already in existence. And obviously you would try and bring other new activities into the facility. Okay, thank you. Any other question, Councillor Davy? No? No, that answers my question. Okay, thank you. Councillor Warren? Yes, a very, very quick question. It's actually to the officers. I'm just wondering after Mr Guild's uh, request, are the officers going to be able to give Mr Guild and his engineers access to Lockside Leisure Centre now to, to, to have a look over it? Okay, that might be one for Mr Cochran. Thank you, Deputy Provost. Uh, indeed, we're, we're aware of Mr Guild's request previously. Firstly, uh, back in August, which was prior to the council making a decision on a legal case, and then uh, previously in terms of looking to respond to the consultation. And indeed, we had others who wanted to visit the building uh, ahead of the consultation, particularly for the community council. And we had to refuse that in terms of the COVID restrictions and the guidance that was with us at that time. Uh, however, uh, the uh, commercial property market, as with the residential property market, does allow for people to leave their homes to uh, visit property for the pur pur purpose of uh, lease or purchase, which I believe Mr. Guild is, is now talking about. Thank you. Thank you. Can I just also re remind members, that was my mistake there actually, um, the questions that you're asking are to the deputation only at this stage. Thank you. Councillor Hans, a question to the deputation. I do promise, I get you promise, but I've also got two points of clarification that might go to questions to officers later, if that's okay. Yes, of course. Um, Mr Gould, you mentioned in your um, presentation that, that the desire for part or, or some or all of the £450,000 um, that have been designated in reserves for dem uh, demolition to go to the project. Can you tell me, coming from a ward in Money Thief and Sidlaw, where we have no council leisure facilities at all, how I explain that spend to my constituents? Um, that will obviously be for your own ward. I'm only speaking for Forfar. Um, the issues that you're suffering in your ward are obviously an Angus Council issue. And um, I would suggest you take that up with them and you're there to represent them. So good luck. Councillor Duff, question to Mr Guild or Mr Wilson. 
Thank you, Deputy Provost. I guess my question is for Mr. Wilson. Uh, from, from my memory, the, this leisure centre has been closed for over four years now, from 2017 until now. Um, I'm not particularly reassured by Mr. Wilson's comments about he's needing time to work it up. I mean, this sounds like it's all come together very recently, and I would have thought that if there was an alternative use for this building, people, the community group should have been working on this for several years now. Uh, what's why is why is it suddenly now that everyone's wanting to work? Uh, this could have been done. This work could have been done several years ago. And I'm I'm not a little bit uncomfortable about we're just starting to think about it now. Um, why the delay? I think Mr. Guild's going to answer this one, Councillor Duff. Mr. Guild, I think we've had a council who have been blindly committed to demolition, and in that time we've had over two thousand people in a survey who fought to save Lockside Leisure Centre. And the people are now only beginning to get hope that we've got a council that are going to listen. They've listened to the court session result. They're listening to us today. And there's hope now that we can do something. But we can do nothing without Angus Council. If Angus Council choose to block something, we're powerless. That applies to individuals, that applies to my business, that applies to the Leisure Centre. And we are begging this council to work with us and at least give all these groups the opportunity. It's no more than an opportunity. You lot have had that place closed for four years. You can surely give us another four or eight weeks to put something together for the good of the very community that you represent. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Guild and Councillor Duff. Councillor Whiteside, a question for the deputation. Thank you. Um, I had a question for Mr. Wilson, but it was actually very similar to Councillor Duff's question. But I would just like to, to comment in response to um, Mr. Guild. That's not absolutely true because if a CAT application had been received by the Council in the recent times, they would have been obliged to um, have taken it forward and gone to consultation over it. The, the problem all the way through has been that there have been no applications from communities for a community asset transfer. And, and that was the, the biggest worry. Um, that there wasn't an interest in taking it forward. If, if Mr. Wilson has got a credible plan, it would be really good to see that. But I, I do think at this stage, it would have to be moved forward reasonably quickly. Thanks. Thank you. Mr. Wilson, do you wish to come back on that? It was a bit of a comment rather, so rather than a question, but. Yes, please. Um, yeah. Uh, sort of, I'll answer both of them, I think. It was just to say that I did mention that we're a relative new trust. We've been in existence for less than a year, so we couldn't have done anything before now. I'm not speaking as an individual. I'm speaking on behalf of the trust. And as chair of that trust, I was asked to come along today and give my comments. So it's not a case that we haven't been doing anything. There wasn't anybody to do anything. There wasn't a trust in existence. Okay, thank you. Councillor Speed, a question to Mr Wilson and Mr Guild. Yep, thank you, Deputy Provost. Uh, for Mr. Guild, um, Mr. Guild, it's nice to meet you. Um, I'm an independent councillor for Arbroath East and Lunan, and like you, believe in working together with all within council, our partners, key stakeholders, businesses, and our local communities. In terms of meeting the varying needs of the Forfar community, the residents of Angus and beyond, can you just please explain a little bit more about what you would plan to do with the building to ensure it was indeed a facility that was accessible for all? You mentioned toilet facilities for all. Um, I'm not sure if you're aware of what a change in place facility is. Um, I can explain if needed, um, but would you be committed to including one of these facilities um, to meet the needs of some of the residents of Angus who in fact are, are often excluded and, and, and marginalized from from society. Could you could you please fully explain what a change in places facility is? Yeah. Yeah, okay. So it is um, bigger than a standard disabled toilet. Um and it is able to accommodate um equipment that's needed uh to help some um people transfer um and to have their, their basic care needs met. Um so I'm not sure if you're aware of a, a change in table. Um, a track and hoist um, that's able to assist with transfers. Um, 
I know there's certainly there's one very great big toilet, huge, and I think with a shower and everything in it as well within the leisure centre. There's possibly two of them, um, but there's a huge abundance of toilets. But that is the whole purpose of this community centre. It's for the community, and the idea is to meet everyone's needs. There'll be lots of people will love, lots of people love to go to the loch. It's the perfect place to pop in, cafeteria, all the various gymnastics, football, whatever's going on, just for people to go and enjoy just some peace and some time. To do so, we have to, we've not been in the building, we've not been allowed to cost the building. And um, we have to look at it. It's three years since we were in. We need to check it's all there, make sure everything's fine, get an exact plan and make sure there's all these people who have the uses. And I'm sure we have a lot to do with Alistair, but I'm sure there'll be more and more will come out of the woodwork when they say something, there's possibly something going to happen here and let's work together and let's make it happen. What a success that would be. Okay, Councillor Speed. Okay, thank you, Deputy Provost. Yeah, just a follow-up comment and question. A quest, as long as it's a question, because we're not at comments yet. Question? Yeah, it was It was just, you know, I'm able to confirm that there isn't a change in places facility within the building as it currently is. Um, but just wondered if Mr Gill could just explain a little bit more then with bearing in mind what he's just said, what he would do to reach out and engage and include and cater for individuals and groups who do experience health and social and economic inequalities. Um, you touched on some activities there, um, but but for some people those activities would be would be hard to to participate in. Would you be there could be lots to of explore um, just a range of possibilities that do include those with. I'm happy to get involved in any way I can. Much of the activities Alistair's really looking to take on, but I've been in touch with the church. We've looked at food banks, we've looked at breakfast for children, lots of things. It is there for the community and the community is an all-encompassing title. That is everyone. And it's where are the needs and you must then try and satisfy that need. As we learn of the needs, you then do your best to satisfy them. It's like when we're building houses, we don't know what people want. So we put forward suggestions and the houses evolve with the customer. Lockside Community Centre would be exactly the same. Thanks, Mr. Gild. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, thank you both. Councillor Blaze, a question for Mr. Wilson or Mr. Gild. Thank you. Yes, I actually have two questions, if that's okay. Uh, absolutely. On you go. Uh, the, the, the first one, uh, Mr. Gild, it relates to the question that you asked of us at the end of your presentation, where you asked whether uh, we were aware that Mr. Kelly had formerly worked in Angus Council. Uh, I certainly wasn't aware of that, but I did listen intently earlier when Mr. Kelly uh, went through the process that proved that they were independent. Uh, and I assume, and I'm prepared to accept that uh, Mr. Kelly's own uh, professional integrity is, is, a, is not a question for me, I'm quite content that, uh, that his professional integrity is intact. Uh, Mr. Blaise, is, is there a question here? Like to, I would like to ask Mr. Gill if he's content that Mr. Kelly's professional integrity is intact. That's my first question. Well, I it was only through Mr. Bennett stating that Paul Kelly led the work. Now, we've been researching scrutiny and audit committee meetings to try and understand who assets were, we then found McCreef, we then found reference to McCreef. And obviously Mr. Kelly is a professional person with very high standards. How you can provide an external report, if this is the same Paul Kelly, how you can provide an external report or an independent report, although I would point out that assets report does not say it's independent. It, of order. Okay. Chair, point of order, this has got nothing to do with the report. Now, can we move on to the report, please? I've got another uh, question, Councillor. Is Councillor Fairweather stopping me answering the question? No, it's not. The, the, the question actually has nothing to do with the report, Mr Gill, so I'm actually going to stop it, and Mr Councillor Blaze is going to go on no, to... You're also stopping me answering the question that I tried to do earlier on. Thank you. 
Yes, my, my, my next question is uh, to, to Mr. Gildor, Mr. Wilson, if he'd rather answer. Um, it, it's, it's known, it's, it's accepted, I think, that community asset transfers always work best when you have a group who have an idea and then they go out looking for premises where they might be able to do that. And, and, and what you're suggesting here is completely the other way around. Um, it's, we've got a building here, uh, the council want to knock it down, maybe someone else could use it. Um, and, you know, that's fair enough as far as I'm concerned. But my question uh, really is, uh, how, how long, you, you said a period of four to eight weeks, um, are you quite content that if no, no one comes forward in that period, then we can forget all about community asset transfers and charitable trusts? Yes, I think you need time to put forward a, a professional um, report as to how best it would work. The council need guarantees. The councils can't just let a, a building go on a whim. There has to be a good business case and there has to be a plan of action. And all we're really asking for is the opportunity to do so. We do have to be mindful. This building has been getting demolished for the last four years. And as a, as, a, as a final supplementary, um, you're of course aware that as it stands, by law, the ground and the building belong to the proper common good. Um, are you quite, uh, quite content to go along uh, and proceed down this route in the knowledge that this could have serious financial com uh, consequences for the common good, because the common good could well be expected to pick up the tab for the ongoing running costs while any community asset transfer is sorted out. For a community asset transfer, I think it takes a few months to do that, but I'm sure a lease could be done in a very short period of time. A long lease could be done in a very short period of time and um, would be up and running. But, you know, at the same time, while we're looking at that together, we just need to get into the building and inspect it. And that's the very first thing we need to do. We need to get in and let's have a good look and let's do something positive together. Yeah, well, thank, thank you very much, Mr. Guild. And uh, I've certainly no problems with, uh, with you or your people having a look in the building as long as it's COVID compliant. I very much appreciate that. Thank you. Okay, thank you both. Councillor Moore, a question to the deputation? Yes, I actually have three questions. Um, firstly, just following on from Councillor Speed's question, have you been inside the free cub? Because they sorry. have a changing is there. Sorry, sorry. The free cub. No. Have you been in the free cub? Free cub? No, but because I can. Places there, and therefore you could see one. That would be helpful. I will do so. The next question you were referring, putting in food banks, possibly in this centre. Are you aware that the Angus Food Bank is just up the road? Yes, I was. My work with the food banks were with one of the local churches, and it was the minister that expressed an interest in possibly doing a breakfast club within the, the leisure centre. Um, that's where that came from. I'm very aware of the, the Angus Food Bank along from the Leisure Centre as we, um, we bought a van for them on one occasion. So would you be suggesting possibly relocating the food bank there? No, that's not my, that's not my remit. It's, well, if there's an opportunity, that opportunity is there for everyone. So we would look, we would, we would look at everything. Right. And being a little bit facetious, you were quoting percentages of 64.1% of people wanted to have something to do rather than demolish. Um, given that it was only 2.5% of the four for population, would you accept that that only actually works out at 1.6%? Um, which would mean 0.8% for those that want to demolish on the same basis. Mm-hmm. But, Glad you agree the point. Yeah. Okay. Um, I have a question for officers. I don't know when I can ask it. No, the, the next, uh, this is a question for, for the deputation, yeah. uh, Councillor Moore. So when we actually move on to the, the report officially, then there will be uh, an opportunity to ask officers questions at that point. 
Councillor Devine, a question for the deputation. Yes, um, I have a real concern about the Common Good Fund, I have to say. And you're talking about a lease, whether that was a cat lease or just a lease. Um, where would the Common Good Fund come into that? Because I have the horrible feeling that we would have to have the bills for maintenance of the building. And in the long term, at some point, that building will have to be demolished. Now you're considering using the money, you would like the money to be used that's there for demolition at the moment in, an, in another way. And I can understand that, but who's going to pay for the demolition eventually? And I fear that it might well be the Common Good Fund. The building, I suppose, as with every building, will come to a point where it needs demolition. Um, you can have performance bonds for all sorts of things. And it's just a case of having a performance bond in place to take care of demolition. Now, we would certainly be prepared to, we do it with, with roads line all the time. We build a road and we take out a bond. We have to put up a surety to confirm the road will be built. It happens with build contracts as well. It could easily happen with a demolition contract. And the point I'm making is, if there's pain, I'm happy personally as a company to share the pain and work with the council. We just need the chance initially to get into the building and see now what, three years on what we're dealing with. Yeah, we can do that, we can, we can report fully, but if there's a willingness to work with us, there's more than a willingness here to work. And if we can do something, if we can benefit the community, that would be such a success for us all. But uh, I'm not talking about, I wasn't asking for the £400,000, I was asking for the council to have a rationale in their thoughts about it, rather than spending 400,000 to take something away from the community, would we spend a part of it to keep something for the community? It may be, we look to take on the demolition contract in the future. There's, there's, may, there's ways and means, but for today, I, I have to kindly ask you all to vote, to give us the opportunity to move to the next stage, see in the building and use our best efforts. It's now down to us, as has previously been said by Angus Council. It's now down to us. If we want to save the building, we now have to use our best efforts. And we'll propose to do that in the shortest time possible. And that's how I said four to eight weeks. Well, I think that would be very useful. And that would certainly help the Common Good Fund uh, not have to, to deal with a lot of uh, expenditure. It's, it's common good land, land um, and the whole purpose of this is to try to do something for the common good. Mm -hmm. Building houses for me has been good in Forfar and I'd like to be good to, with the community too. And if we can do something together as a community and we can help and we can make a difference, would that not be super? Yep. Okay, thank you, thank you both. Thank you both. Councillor Davy, you've, you've asked questions already. Is this a point of clarification? No, no, it was a notice of amendment for the next bit. I'm ahead of schedule, sorry. Right, okay, thank you. Okay, no further questions then for the deputation. Okay, Mr Cochrane, would you like to introduce your report, please? Thank you, Deputy Provost. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, the report before you is the outcome of the initial consultation and sets out the next steps for your consideration of the fourth former leisure centre, sorry, at Thorther Lock. Uh, the council at this meeting on the 5th of November considered report 26920 and you agreed a two-stage consultation process. The purpose of this, the first stage uh, consultation was to inform the council about the strength of public feeling and to guide council towards choosing one of the options for the statutory consultation as required under the Community Empowerment Act. The report before you sets out uh, uh, the information, uh, particularly in the appendices. Appendix one gives you the process that was presented to members in November and we followed as the initial consultation, as well as what the next steps would be for the formal consultation. Uh, appendix two details how we undertook that consultation, uh, which was launched in, in December 2020 and ran for eight weeks. And uh, gives a breakdown of the 334 responses that we receive and information uh, on the social media uh, uh, 
that we put out, etc. Appendix three gives you uh, in great detail the, the, the comments that we received as part of that consultation. And then Appendix four uh, gives an option appraisal, which details how each option could be delivered along with estimated timelines, costs and risks. Clearly, that is as we saw them and as we wrote them, as opposed to the presentation that you've seen today. And the option appraisal is intended to guide and inform uh, and support members in reaching a decision on the options presented. And then in the recommendation section of the report, uh, it sets out uh, the, uh, for members the things for consideration today uh, and noting the initial consultation members are asked to, to, to note and determine the next steps for the building. I trust that's of assistance. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Cochran. And just to follow on from uh, what Mr. Cochran said before we go to um, any questions, uh, the Council has chosen members to go out to public consultation on the future of the former Lockside Leisure Centre. And as a result, members must have regard to the responses from that consultation. This means we must ensure we have taken account fully of the views detailed in the consultation. Members are free not to follow the majority view in the consultation, provided clear reasons and justifications are given for this. So we'll now go to questions. And the first one's hand up is Councillor Davy. question. Um, yes, it was a question to Mr Cochran. Obviously, the consultation period happened over lockdown and all in-person consultation events were cancelled. Uh, there was a phone line set up. I'm just wondering how effective that phone line was and how many received it and how many, we would, how many people on a normal in-person consultation we would receive on that. Thank you for yourself, Deputy Provost. Yes, of um, course. We, we set up the uh, phone line in January uh, as a result of the uh, lockdown that, was, uh, that came into place. And we didn't actually get any uh, um, responses by, by phone. Um, I think um, Mr. Guild has already commented that it was a, a reasonably good response to the consultation. And members will be aware that we also had a, a consultation on car parking running uh, for a much shorter period of two weeks of December and uh, had a much more substantial response. Okay, thank you very much both. Councillor Laurie, question? Yep, thank you, Deputy Provost. This is just a comment and a question sort of wrapped together on the initial consultation. Um, if we're to make sure that our decisions reflect the wishes of local people, it's important that our consultations get as many respondents as possible. And that requires a variety of methods of communication. With that in mind, I welcome the Council's use of social media to reach residents, and I found the summary of social media engagement on pages 106 and 107 helpful. My question is, has there been any consideration of the use of paid advertising on Facebook to promote our consultations? Um, Facebook advertising is a relatively inexpensive way of reaching people and can be localised by postcode sector um, so that we're targeting the right local people. Um, is this something that the council has used before and has there been any considerations of it? Uh, I'll try and take that to Deputy Provost. Um, it certainly wasn't used uh, on this occasion. Uh, as you've said, the social media reach was quite extensive from our own uh, um, uh, sites, etc. We also, uh, with thanks to uh, the um, what are the account holders? It was advertised on Save Lockside Leisure uh, site, uh, as well as working for you in Angus. So uh, it had a reasonable, uh, a good coverage through, through that. Uh, it may be that it's something that we can think of in, in terms of uh, future use. Thank you, Councillor Larry. Okay, thank you both. Councillor Nicholl, question? Question, yes. Thank you, Deputy Provost. In reading the paper on the Lockside Centre, pages 127, Appendix 5, it states that all options 2 to 5 are deemed to be a disposal of either the buildings or the buildings and land and require local authority to seek court approval, sheriff court or court accession. Letting of common good land or buildings is not disposal. 
and the ownership would stay with the common good and would not require to go to court and would similarly be similar to any other common good property or land we let out and would only have to comply with section 104 of the Community Empowerment Act 2015. Would this be a true statement? Is that your question, Councillor Nicholl? Because that was quite a comment, actually. Well, I thought it was a, I was saying it was, is that a true statement? <laughs> well, which officer's going to answer that one? That Mrs Buchanan, maybe, I think. Is that a legal one? Um, yes, uh, thank you, Deputy Provost. Sorry, I couldn't get my mute off there for a second, Councillor Nicholl. Um, could sorry, I did some, you cut out a little bit during your narrative. Could could you just would you mind just repeating it again so I can make sure I've got the correct page on the report and the also page, can hear what you're saying? Yeah, the page was 127. It's actually the appendix following appendix five following the page 127, where it states that uh, options two to five are deemed to be a disposal of buildings or buildings and land. And I'm saying when, if we are letting the common good, it would not be a disposal. It, the ownership would still stay with the common good. And, and, and we would only have to go to section 104 of the Community Empowerment Act 2015 to comply with this. And, Um, thank you. I, I'm clear now on the position. There's two different parts of legislation um, in terms of what, what you're speaking about. So you're talking about the Community Empowerment Act, and that, that relates to uh, community asset transfers and leases. So there's a requirement there in, in terms of um, the community asset transfer legislation to do a public consultation. Um, also, because um, there's 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 a legislation in terms of going to the court, and and that's separate from uh, a disposal, which also relates to common good land under section 104. So, under the legislation that requires you to go to court, a lease is treated as a disposal, and that's that's been the situation for quite a considerable length of time. That isn't recent legislation. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Councillor Moore. Question. Yes, I have a question really of Mrs Buchanan, I think. Um, I've been listening to what's been said and there's obviously strength of feeling there. Is it possible that we can defer this item until the May meeting to give Mr Guild and Mr Wilson chance to bring a proposal together which could then form the basis of formal consultation? Yes, um, you, you would, you're looking at the various options. So in terms of that, you could certainly agree to do, defer the report to give an opportunity for, I, th I think in effect, you'd just be deferring the report um, because you, you know, you're looking at the, the different opportunities and options in terms of the consultation. And if you were to go down the route um, in terms of that consultation of just determining that you wanted to go for one outcome, that doesn't sit entirely with the different options in terms of the consultation. But you could certainly defer the report to allow a party to bring forward, um, if they wanted to bring forward perhaps a lease. Is, is that what you're talking about? You need to really get specifics, Councillor Moore, in terms of what you're looking at, because um, there hasn't been any amendment as such in terms in terms of that brought forward so I'd really need to see the detail of what you're proposing and be able to advise on that in terms of what the recommendations are in the report and how that sits in terms of the consultation so I'm not saying that's not possible but I'd like to see wording on that if, if you were inclined to do that. Yes I'm simply thinking about recommendation 1-3 in light of what was said in the last item that the council confirms that it has the information required to make a decision regarding recommendation four below, which is determining the options. Now there is obviously new information coming out in this meeting, which is pertinent and relevant. And I don't feel that 
if we've got this in the background, that we have got all the information to make a de the decision. I would ho hope that we can defer it to the next meeting. And then this information that Mr. Guild and Mr. Wilson are bringing forward can probably be formalized so that we can then consider it amongst all the other options. Yes, you, you would certainly be able to defer the report if that's what you wish to do. All right, thank you. I'll give notice of an amendment later, Deputy Provost. Yes, well, C Councillor Davies already given notice of an amendment, so we'll be hearing uh, Councillor Davies' amendment first. Uh, that's after I ask if anybody's going to move any options in the report. But at this point in time, we are on questions. Then we will have comments, and then we will go to the options in the report. So any questions? Councillor Hans, a question? Question to the uh, to the officer. Yeah, it's two questions for Mrs. Buchanan, and they're both just points of clarification. Um, obviously, with any local government decision, we're bound by best value. Is there any best value implications for common good? Okay, Mrs. Buchanan. In, in terms of common good, yes, we still have, we're still still bound by uh, best value, councillor hands. Right, so we need to take that into consideration when we're, we're looking at the options or any deferral in future additional information. The other question, and you know, it might sound churlish and flippant, it's not intended to be, just in terms of the comments we've had in the re previous report in terms of councillors not asking appropriate questions at policy and the cases. Can I ask um, if this was a planning decision at, at development standards, the fact that we've had an offer from a developer to support this, technically speaking, that would actually be enough to stop council uh, members from taking part in a decision making process. Are we okay in terms of the councillor's code of conduct having been promised funding, not actually a named amount of funding, but can we still go ahead and take a decision impartially when we've had that suggestion of funding? In, in terms of that, um, the planning situation is different in respect of it being quasi-judicial. Now, this goes back to what I was saying to Councillor Moore in terms of we need to be clear what members were determining today. Um, now, I understand Councillor Davy has already indicated that he has an amendment that he wants to put forward. In terms of standing orders, I'm, I'm um, mindful that in relation to bring, bringing forward amendments, the restrictions on what you can do on the actual day. So that's why in terms of anything that's going to be brought forward just now, which officers have not had sight of, I would like to see the wording. Um, however, as, as mentioned, and as Councillor Davy has mentioned, he has an amendment which has gone through the, the process in terms of consideration. So in short, Councillor Hans, it would depend on what members are, are determining. I don't think the fact um, that this is not a quasi-judicial setting um, so to that extent, it's not the same as a planning application. Okay, thank you. Councillor Davies, use a question. Yes, it's a point of uh, clarification as well from, from officers. And yes, there is an amendment coming in. Um, so the, the point of clarification is there's been discussions on the financing um, happening a few times. And within the report, I think this is both for Mr. Cochrane and Mr. Lorimer, Within the report, we make assumptions on what the results of the Court of Sessions court case will be. Is it correct, therefore, to assume that we do not know that until Angus Council has decided, and that will be obviously at a future meeting? So when we discuss the financials, I would just like a bit more clarification on what assumptions have been made in this report. And actually, we don't have a decision on how this is going to impact us yet. I, I'm probably best placed to take that one, Deputy Provost. Yes, that's of course, okay. Mr Lorimer, yes. Thank you and good afternoon, uh, uh, members. Yes, um, there, as Councillor Davy says, there's, there's reference in the report in the financial um, section uh, in terms of that, uh, that further piece of work, the, the report that will come to Council in uh, May regarding the uh, accounting policy for 
effectively dealing with the consequences of the outcome of the of the of the court case. Um, so the outcome of the court case is that the, as has been mentioned uh, already on, on, on in the meeting, uh, the the leisure centre land and building uh, are both uh, common good assets, uh, and the court was clear that the building, um, which we have uh, historically treated as a general fund asset, is indeed uh, an asset of the common good and has actually been an asset of the common good since it was constructed. So that has pretty significant implications uh, for how we account for both general fund uh, assets and common good assets. That will require us to bring forward a policy uh, paper in May. That policy paper will look at the historic position. It will look at what the future arrangement should be. And it will also have to look at what, the, um, what, what I would refer to as transitional arrangements uh, would need to be uh, in terms of how we handle um, uh, the scenario really that the, the, the court decision uh, left us with, which is that uh, effectively overnight um, the, the classification of assets has, has changed. So council need to consider that policy report uh, when it's brought forward in May. Um, we've made assumptions within the report as to when um, the common good effectively would become liable for things like running costs, etc. But that is only for the purpose of the, uh, the options appraisal. The decision on that would come, uh, as I say, in, the, in that report in, in May. So the May report will cover the policy dimensions, but it will also cover um, effectively how we deal with uh, examples like Lockside Leisure Centre, uh, which have been uh, impacted by the, 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 the court decision. So um, we would know, for example, there will be uh, running costs until the building uh, has been, the future of the building has been determined. What we're not in a position to say at this point is whether that would fall to be met by the common good or the general fund. I think the starting position in terms of proper accounting practice would be uh, the, the such, such things would, would fall to the common good. The council could, however, uh, choose to um, uh, in effect, subsidise that perhaps for a period as part of its uh, consideration of the policy. But all of those things will come forward, uh, uh, councillors, in that in that May report. So I hope that helps, uh, Councillor Davy. Thank you very much. Yeah, it's it's um, just the information I was looking for. Thank you. Okay, thank you both, Councillor Duff. A question. Yeah, thanks, uh, Deputy Provost. And it's probably uh, it's a kind of follow-on question on the financials for Mr. Lorimer. Um, I mean, clearly, I think Councillor Devine has flagged up the fact that she's concerned about the drain on for, for common good and potentially if we have a long delay and, and from our past experience, cats can drag on for quite some time. And if we had to petition the court of session, we could see a, a potential delay there um, because it would be, as Mrs. Buchanan said, a disposal. Uh, so that would be a further drain on the common good. And then if at the end of the day it all went wrong and the building had to be demolished and that cost also fell in for for common good, um, has, has, it, has it ever happened in Scotland that a common good has gone bust? And if it did, what would we do, Mr Lorimer? I guess that's the question. It may be a, a disaster scenario, but um, we should be testing that out, I guess. Thank you, Deputy Provost. Thank you, Councillor Duff. Yeah, the, I, I don't know. I honestly don't know whether um, any common goods have have gone bust. Um, they've been around for uh, hundreds of years in most cases, so um, the, the 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 history there is 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 uh, you know length, lengthy. Um, one of the things, and this is something we need to check out uh, absolutely in terms of the the legalities of it, uh, is whether uh, in relation to the common good. Uh, the, the council council funds could be used to support the common good funds. Now that takes us in, takes uh, us into territory around uh, you know cross subsidisation. It would be using council taxpayers' money um, to support uh, common good funds, which, as councillors are aware, uh, are, are intended for the, the, the benefit of, of inhabit inhabitants of, of, of certain boroughs. Um, we think that that would be legally possible, but we need to check that out. We'll be doing that as part of bringing forward the, the report that I've mentioned uh, in, in May. Assuming it was legal to do it, then um, the council could, if it felt it was appropriate, both in terms of best value for the common good and best value for the general fund, consider the use of, of, uh, of general fund resources to, uh, to support a I think, as you're alluding to, Councillor Duff, almost a crisis situation in a, in a common good fund. That is, a, that is 
a, a, a tricky area for uh, council and councillors to uh, to consider. Though I would I would suggest. Thank you. Okay, councillor Dove. Yeah, 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 Deputy Provost. I mean, I think that what council uh, what um, Mr. Lorimer is saying is this explodes the problem from being a forfer problem potentially to being a council wide problem. Yeah. Thank you. Maybe a nationwide one as well, Councillor. Duff. Yes, thank you. Any other questions? Okay. Comments then before we take motions or amendments? Comments? Councillor Chief. Thanks, um, Deputy Provost. Didn't think I'd be up quite as early as that. Um, but I've sat back and listened to all this for some considerable time. I'm going right back to the Policy and Resources Committee. I think that's been referred to the 2018 meeting and that uh, people voted for demolished. But then we didn't really have the full picture at that time. And I certainly didn't know at that time it was going to cost half a million pounds. And that was consequently why I voted against that uh, when it came up for discussion later on. So, you know... I probably break rank here, but I, I actually congratulate Mr. Guild on his persistence in this matter. Um, yes, um, talking frankly, it's probably been a bugbear for many people, council officers and elected members. But that's what we're here for: is to listen to people. And um, so, you know, from my point of view, uh, my support was for uh, non-demolition, um, and that was to save council money. It was not uh, to make a waste of. Um, a criminal amount of money, as far as I'm concerned. That is certainly not best value, no matter how you want to look at it whatsoever. Um, I think really looking at the options, we should take the time and offer the community groups time to view the building, certainly view the building, raise applications and notes of interest, and hopefully offers to purchase, lease, or bring forward a cat transfer. Um, however, Taking the point that um, uh, that um, Sheila um, uh, brought up, money is um, as I I voted to actually save this money. I did wouldn't be voting to use this money for to support the ongoing use of um, uh, the the former Lockside Leisure Centre. This is council money for the whole of Angus. It shouldn't be put purely to this one one um, potential project, but. I totally support this going forward in some way, shape and form. We should be listening to the community. There's a real feeling, uh, I think, of uncomfortableness about all of this um, in the way procedures have been adopted and carried out. And I think we need to learn from all of that going forward. Um, but certainly we should be, the length of time it's taken, now that we've got the opportunity for parties to actually get involved, get into the building um, and come up, if they're serious about it, come up and come up quickly with proposals and listening to what Mr. Guild is saying about potential financial support. I welcome all of that. That is us working together. That's cross-functionality. That's everything um, that's correct about this. Um, anything but demolition, as far as I'm concerned. Demolition would be a criminal waste of money. And I think we really should be actually looking a little bit out beyond the box now and actually reaching out to um, all parties concerned to come to a mutual um, agreement as to how we move forward with this, even if it's an allotted time to give these people the chance to, to um, come up with an option. Thank you. Thank you very much, Councillor Cheap. Councillor Moore, a comment? Yes, very much a comment, Deputy Provost. Um, I'll just refer members back to what Ari said about recommendation 1-3 that we have to confirm we have the information required to make a decision in the light of what, what Mr. Lorimer has said. I don't think we have. Okay, Councillor Moore, thank you. Councillor Dunn, no comment? Yeah, thanks, Deputy Provost. Um, I agree with what uh, Councillor Cheap saying as well. I took a run up there the other day with my husband and uh, asked his opinion because obviously he didn't know what the story was. And um, he said that if Mr. Gilb wants to take over the building with his reputation and everything good that he's done through housing, etc., then he knows um, how to look after buildings, what to do with buildings. And the fact that it's an eyesore at the moment, nobody's getting to use it. 
Um, and he said, well, you know, if it had been anybody, any other company, they would have bit the hand off of somebody that wanted to buy a building like this. So I'm going with the flow. And um, if Mr. Guild wants to take it on and get a community group to run it, then off you go, fill your boots. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Councillor Durno. Councillor Dell for comment. Thank you. Yeah, I just wanted to comment on, I mean, Councillor Cheat was saying that demolishing the building was a criminal waste of money. Um, some months ago, I asked Mr. Cochran for demolition costs of, of a number of different assets. And I've got a long list here, but I mean, the two pertinent ones are Forfer Academy costs uh, £460,000 to demolish and Brecon High School £404,000. So if we take Forfer Academy and let's round it up to half a million and let's round up the uh, leisure centre to half a million, that's a million pound demolition costs. But you've got to remember it's a 30, it was a £38 million pound project, so that's a 3% demolition cost. I think you have to look at the demolition cost in relation to the overall size of the project. That's just a comment I would make. Thank you, Councillor Duff. Councillor Boyd, a comment. Thank you, Deputy Provost. Uh, yes, I'm keeping in, in line with uh, what Councillor Cheap said as well, and also keeping consistent to what I said at the same meetings as Councillor Cheap. In fact, I think I seconded the situation that it shouldn't be. Uh, 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 Councillor Braden Davies' um, uh, motion, I seconded the way back then that you know, we must do our utmost to try and, and de demolition should be the last uh, thing there. So I'll keep consistent in my views uh, on that. Um, and therefore, moving on, I personally think we should try and uh, hold this back for until the next political cycle, six weeks. Um, uh, Mark Guild is asking for four to eight weeks to uh, let them go in and have a look. I think that would therefore, the, uh, if you look at the stuff that option three was a lease and option four was a cat, these two would then be off the, or, or, either of these two would be off the, off the equation if that's what Mr Guild or, uh, and I should remember uh, the gentleman's name. Mr um, Wilson. Mr. Yes, that's it. That's it. <laughs> Thank you, Craig. You know, they, they've both come here. They've both given their time. They've both said, look, we can look at these things. They're only asking for a four to eight week. We work in a six week cycle. Uh, I think we should try and uh, work with them, look at these two, and then we can move forward accordingly. Thank you, Councillor Boyd. Councillor Fayweather, comment? Yes, uh, right, thanks, Deputy Provost. Um, uh, after the week I've had, it takes a bit of doing for me to get a little bit excited, I can, I, I can tell you. <laughs> um, but, uh, after listening to Mr Guild, uh, and certainly Mr Wilson, and I know Mr Wilson uh, very well from his time at, at the council, I'm certainly willing to take a chance on this. Uh, the, the idea that uh, there could be a lot of groups in, uh, involved in this, I actually see a light at a, at a very a very long tunnel coming to an end. It would be, you know, and I think the people of Forfar will more than appreciate it. And I think all the elected members, from what I'm hearing at the moment, uh, um, will, will support this. Um, uh, Mr. Uh, Mr. Gill mentioned uh, uh, CAT and, and um, Community Trust, and I certainly think um, any applica application coming forward should be investigated. And I'd be certainly agreeing to defer this. Okay, thank you, Councillor Fairweather. Councillor Blaze, a comment. Thank you. Yes, thank you very much, Convener. Um, you know, I'm, I'm keeping an open mind about this uh, entirely, but I would just like to point out that when Brechin, the new Brechin High School and campus was built, the old leisure centre closed. That was it. No question about it. And also, the city hall was offloaded because there was a pe sort of theatre facility in, uh, in the new campus. And, you know, I'll, I'll be really concerned if uh, Brechin lost, uh, lost out in this. You know, if, if Brechin council taxpayers end up having to fund something in Forfa when we lost the city hall, Angus Council pulled out. Uh, Angus Council's never pulled out of any other town halls, and it, and it grates with the people in Brechin. And I just wanted to make that comment. 
Thank you, Councillor Blaise. Okay, I don't see any other hands up for comments. So, going to the report and the recommendations within the report, has anyone minded to move any of these options within this report? Do you like my amendment now? Sorry, Deputy Provost. Yes, well, I'm, I'm just asking, trying to uh, find out, Councillor Davy, if anybody's going to move any of the options in the report, and that would appear that that's not going to be the case. So, yes, uh, if we can hear your amendment now, please. Um, yes, thank you, um, Deputy Provost. I think if the amendment is now circulated, and you will be very pleased to hear it is, I was waiting patiently, as everyone said, they agreed with my amendment before I'd even presented the amendment, so it was very happy to, to hear that. Um, uh, would you like a, a recess or would you like me to just speak to the amendment now, Deputy Provost? Um, well, I think members should have, if they're having documentation sent out to them, I think they would need time to, to read that, would they? So, would, what, 10 minutes, 15 minutes? I certainly don't have any yet, Deputy Provost. Nothing's come in. No, so I think we'll, uh, that'll be coming out by email, I think, Councillor Bell. I think that's promised it put out on share screen, so we just look at it while we've got it on the screen. Well, that's a good idea, Councillor King. Mr McCaskill, is that possible? I can't beat that. Oh, no, Councillor Hans will need a Word document, I think. Oh, I think that's it coming out now. Yes, Chair, the clerk has circulated an email with the Word version along which uh, financial implications from the Director of Finance. Okay, thank you. It, so, it's reached my phone already, so... Uh, the I've got the amendment I believe as well should allow Mr Guild uh, or interested parties access to the to the building over the period as well. Uh, I believe it will have that dual... Okay. Uh, now, just as members, some of you, if I haven't read it yet, um, do you wish a recess? Or will we just... Yes? Okay. Oh, no, hands, of course. Okay, 15 minutes. 15 minute recess. Is that agreed? Agreed. Okay, we'll be back at 16, well, 16.45. It's almost 15 minutes. Thank you very much.